friends, I am Milind, I come from India and I worked as an undergraduate teacher almost throughout my life and I loved that and I am going to relate to you a story of doing science with undergraduates. The story began as a fun and developed into serious science outcomes, serious research outcomes. Uh, I call the story a katta story or a katta model. Katta in my language Marathi means a place to sit and chat. It could be a roadside or a garden uh, platform on which people come and sit and chat. So we treated science as a chat. For a long time this experiment was done over a span of almost 20 years and throughout we treated science in an upside down way. Generally people think that undergraduate years are preparative years and students learn their basic science there and then they become eligible to research. Well, this is fine. We looked at it in an upside down manner. We used research as a tool in education and the meaning of research is simple. You ask your own questions and try to design experiments and try to get answers to your own questions. So, undergraduates are at the center of this model. And this is substantially different from involving undergraduates in a running lab. In most places, labs have a focus, they have a running uh, research program and undergraduates come and participate in that as summer trainees, as, as their semester project, as uh, their credits and so on. While this differs from that in the sense that it begins with undergraduate ideas, it begins with their thinking, it is their questions their experimental designs and then there is one or more mentors that try to try to navigate them if they are going wrong, uh, stimulate them to thinking bet to think better and help them in some analysis, in some statistics, in writing up and so on. So it is essentially undergraduate creativity that is at the center of this and because they ask a variety of questions, you can venture into new questions which are essentially new areas of science. So, the thinking which is very different, uninhibited, uh, lateral thinking, they ask crazy questions and therefore, you can go into a wide variety of fields of science and also pioneer novel concepts. This becomes possible because undergraduates have a high risk tolerance. A PhD student typically is a little business minded in the sense that the degree is important and the degree needs to come at the end of whatever five years uh, of, of hard work. Uh, you can't say I fail at the end of five years. So you need to begin with something where you know you will get results. Undergraduates do not have this limitation. They can start working on things and if it fails, it fails. They have nothing to lose. They are getting their degree anyway. But if it clicks, it can click in a big way because they are asking new questions. They are doing very different things. So. Uh, Central to this, this model is coming together once in a week for say about hour or two or sometimes it is unlimited, it can go on for several hours. Uh, but there is no predecided speaker, this is not a journal club, this is not where people present papers. This is just a chat, so there is no predecided focus. We might start with physics, we might end up with human behavior and nobody prevents, nobody says that no, no, this is not the subject we are discussing today. So there is random branching and drifting discussion which churns out a large number of ideas and when you, when you have churned out a large number of ideas then it is left for them to take a shape. So I call that natural selection. So uh, if some idea is attractive, some students say that oh I find it interesting, let me work on it. So a number of projects begin but behind all these projects is questioning. Okay, I look at this as a factory of skeptics where they question, they cross question, they challenge things from textbooks and that is where the whole thing begins. But being a skeptic is not the end of it, that is just a beginning. Because once you ask questions, then you need, you have a responsibility and, and, and if you feel the responsibility, you will try to design experiments. So a number of projects take sh shape. And then students are free to pick up any of the projects voluntarily. They are also free to give it up if they feel like there are no credits, grades, no formal academic advantage associated with it. So those who work, work only out of interest. And then all outcomes 
come back to Katta and they are discussed in Katta once again. Some of them we feel that are good and publishable. Some students have ended up patenting their ideas and presenting it conferences. And the spectrum of such publishable work has been pretty wide. Okay. It is amazing that from a single group and that too of undergraduates, we have things that range from microbiology, ecology, evolutionary biology, cogni animal cognition, human behavior, psychology, sex and mating system, game theory and everything done by a group of undergraduates with one or two teachers uh, helping them. In terms of tool sets used also they are equally diverse. Okay. So, we have used theoretical modeling, simulation, meta-analysis, synthesis mainly because this does not need any hi-fi lab. Okay. They can be, this is simply thinking access to a computer and some library enough. Then there are field oriented studies which relate to animal behavior, relate to plant behavior, um, wildlife, simple wildlife uh, ecology. Then there are human uh, experiments uh, which range from questionnaire surveys to behavioral experiments. Then there are wet lab experiments, but simple wet lab experiments which an undergraduate lab can easily do. It does not involve uh, very, very sophisticated instrumentation or a lab, but the question asked are new. So, even these simple wet lab experiments can give us something new. And some students have designed new products, simple things, simple devices in the lab or simple devices in the kitchen and often patented them. There are limitations of undergraduate research no doubt. The most important thing is because of the limitations of time as well as lab facilities, they are unable to build large volume of work. So, whenever we think of publishing, we have to sell our research based on the novelty rather than the volume and rigor of work. Then the funding facilities are limited, uh, writing is a major bottleneck because undergraduates can think, their thinking is crude, but, but, but uh, useful. They can work, they can devote much time, energy, efforts, but they are not mature enough to write. So, their mentors have to come and help them in writing whatever a patent draft, a paper or poster or whatever. Access to literature has been a problem for a long time, but it is now getting resolved because there are so many online uh, sources. Who were the people, who were the students who ended up publishing in uh, reputed journals. They were not necessarily the students with academic excellence. Often they were near dropouts. So, it is independent of this access. It is also independent of the family backgrounds fr from which they come. So, they, some of them have come from poor and even uneducated families. Some of them have come from elite families. Then um, it also seems to be independent of their street smartness because some of them were shy, found difficult to express themselves, others were bold and brilliant. So, it seems to be independent of this, then what was, what was common in them? So, I could say that there are three qualities, all of them had an open frame of mind, they were open to ideas, they were receptive and they were communicative. Uh, they had high level of motivation and excitement about what they were doing and a high level of involvement in, in whatever they did and thought. To give you a couple of examples or I will relate one story to illustrate how the thinking goes and how uh, it develops. In one of these sessions, in one of the kattas, a student suddenly had an idea that uh, uh, if we are talking about pollinators and pollinators is a mutualism. So, the plants produce nectar for the pollinators and the pollinators in turn help the plant by pollinating. Is it possible for the flowers to cheat, cheat the pollinators by not making nectar? Well, this came up as a question and it looked logical because pollinators have no way to know whether there is nectar before entering the flower and therefore, the flowers could cheat. This clicked and some students, uh, uh, a small group of students said that let us go out and try it out. So, then they had to find ways of measuring sugar in nectar in flowers and then they actually went and sampled some 28 species of different uh, flowers and then they come up saying that yes, you do see empty flowers. So, which means that they are cheating and I said no, 
also think of alternatives. It may not be cheating. The empty flowers might be giving certain other advantage. So, look at other possibilities of empty flowers. Then we came up with half a dozen different possible explanations for empty flowers. And then the question was how to resolve between these alternative hypotheses. This is the way thinking goes. Then ultimately, we came up with a way of differentiating between the hypotheses. So, why, what you see here is there are a number of different hypotheses which possibly explain uh, empty flowers. And then all of them make predictions. And then you have a series of predictions and each hypothesis makes a different set of predictions. So, then you can go uh, to real life data, look at which predictions match and then ultimately we decided that the cheating hypothesis stood the test of uh, thing, the alternative hypothesis were rejected. So, if you agree that flowers cheat and some of the flowers do not make nectar, the question is what proportion of flowers should make nectar and what proportion of flowers should be empty. There should be some optimization of that and the optimization is a mathematical problem. So, a group of mathematically oriented students took it as a challenge and they developed uh, mathematical models for it. In fact, we published two papers on optimization of nectar. The problem is complex because it is not only optimizing on how much nectar should be produced. There is a cost of display of the color and fragrance. There is a cost of nectar and then how much should be invested in the display, how much should be invested in the cost. Can I invest in one and not invest in the other? This is a complex problem and but we had good solutions that ended up in two research papers. Well, let me also relate some other questions, some other perhaps crazy looking questions that we tackle. So, for example, whether birds understand geometry, okay, or whether birds have a concept of triangle, whether birds have theory of mind which is a kind of psychological ability, a mental ability that humans have, but whether other animals have or not, we do not know. Then there was an observation that came from uh, data collected by one undergraduate class and it appeared that families within our city that used some extra care of water such as boiling or using devices for purification of water suffered more from diarrheic diseases. Then I, I, I said that it could be the other way. It could be that people who are more susceptible to diarrhea are more likely to use uh, extra treatment of water. We investigated on this problem and there was a Lancet paper coming out of this problem. Then there are other things like evolution of uh, asymmetric cell division in bacteria trying to cultivate the uncultivatable, uncultivable bacteria, uh, asking the question why antibiotics are produced, what is the natural role of antibiotics. And there are a variety of problems that uh, we do discuss and try to come out with something. Well, this has implications to both areas. Number one, in the field of research, it gives certain novel insights, some inroads into virgin lands and so on. But the other is in the field of science education, in capacity building, training the minds. In fact, it is doing a service by inculcating the ability to ask questions, the ability to design experiments, the ability to think critically and so on. So, I distinguish between learning about science, which most of our undergraduate courses do, and actually learning science, which is experiencing the process of making a discovery. And through a process of such uninhibited inquiry, they undergo a process of making a discovery. Whether they make a big discovery or not is, is of relatively minor importance. They have to undergo this uh, process. So, essentially, this was an experiment and is also an ongoing experiment on engaging undergraduates in their own questions, encouraging them to initiate science, not only participate in science, initiate research. And I feel that uh, this model has been successful. Uh, it will only time will tell us what are the impacts on the careers of these students, impacts on science in general in whatever small way it can and uh, impact on science education. So, here are some of my, my heroes, the one batch of uh, Katta. And I hope that many of them turn out to be great scientists in their career. Thank you.